Hi guys, welcome back. Club football returns this weekend, but injury lists are piling up. So what impact will that have on the January transfer window? And with Euro 2021 edging ever closer, which players feel they need a move to get back into the international picture? As always, I'll be answering questions from our Athletic subscribers. You can still subscribe to The Athletic for just £1 or $1 a week by going to theathletic.com forward slash askornstein. There's a ton of great content on the website and app at the moment, including fantastic interviews with Wilfred Zaha and Matthew Flamini, so go and check them out. On this week's show, Liverpool's defensive plans, the Adama Traore situation at Wolves, Tottenham's Deli Alley predicament, and how Manchester United are approaching the January transfer window. Support for Ask Ornstein is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code ASK, that's A-S-K, at checkout. Right, let's get going with Spyros, who asks, Since Liverpool are in an injury crisis and Rudiger wants out at Chelsea, is there any possibility for him joining them? Well, I must say, Spyros, this is not one I've heard anything about, so... The short answer I'm inclined to give you is no. I don't think Rudiger wants out at Chelsea. I just think he wants to play, ideally for Chelsea, and if not, elsewhere, especially with Euro 2021 fast approaching. We saw what happened in the summer, falling out of favour with Frank Lampard. It seemed inevitable that he would be leaving Stamford Bridge. Liverpool, to my knowledge, were not in the frame. Nothing materialised, and despite being somewhat reintegrated into the first team setup, game time has still been in short supply, and you suspect going into and during the January window, his future will again be the subject of intense speculation. Chelsea won't want to do business with a rival, particularly Liverpool, though their stance on that sort of thing appeared to soften somewhat in the last window, because it was Rudiger who actually turned down a move to Tottenham and he felt that going from Chelsea on loan to Spurs and then potentially back again might make life very difficult. In terms of Liverpool, as I reported in my Monday column and on the Ornstein and Chapman podcast, my understanding of their current thinking is that they don't plan to enter the January market for a centre-back or any other position, if at all possible. They would like to go with existing options, so Matip, Fabinho, Phillips, Williams, they will of course be looking at loads of possibilities. They've got one of the most advanced and successful recruitment setups in world football. They've been linked with players such as Upamecano, Koulibaly, Alaba, and I don't think they'll be completely ruling anything out. But as far as I know, their thinking is more geared towards the summer of 2021, and those plans are already well underway. What will be interesting to see is whether any of those plans can be escalated or brought forward if the need marries up to the availability and opportunity. Because what we do know is these things can and often do change at Liverpool and at other clubs. And it will probably come down to their situation on the pitch with results and also whether their injury situation gets even worse. You can find out a lot more about this by listening to the Ornstein and Chapman podcast where I discuss the subject with Simon Hughes or go to his very own podcast, The Red Agenda. Here's one from Amy. Could Adama Traore leave Wolves? Do you think they regret selling Jota this summer over him? Such an intriguing story this one, Amy, isn't it? And it was addressed in my Monday column by Dermot Corrigan and Tim Spears, who outlined how well talks had been progressing and how close a deal was to being done. And now they're at deadlock, very bizarre. Tim mentions in the Molyneux View podcast that it comes down to money, which is often the case with these situations. But it also coincides with his absence from the team. He has been on the bench, I think, for each of the last five Wolves Premier League games, and sources have told The Athletic that Traore believes that's a direct consequence of this contract standoff, although it must be said others reject that and say it's purely down to footballing reasons and that Nuno and a player would never have this level of discussion. He's been heavily linked with a move to even bigger clubs, the likes of Manchester City and Liverpool. We know all about his progress at international level, his impact on the pitch, although his statistics for goals and assists hasn't been so impressive of late. But I'm sure all of those potential suitors will be watching very closely. Wolves, for their part, I'm sure, will be relaxed. He's under contract until 2023, and if they were to sell, 
they'd be looking for at least double the £18 million they paid Middlesbrough for him in 2018. Another layer to this is that he's one of the few Wolves players not represented by George Mendes. I'm not sure if that could make things a little bit tricky. But Wolves won't be panicking, and as Tim points out in that podcast, there's every chance that he could start against Southampton on Monday. Will they regret selling Jota over him? Well, Wolves got really good money for Jota, and I know that looks like money extremely well spent now by Liverpool, but at the time, I remember people thought that Wolves got the better deal and they got a player from Liverpool in exchange as well. He went with Nuno's blessing. It felt like a good deal for all parties. Wolves have invested. Prodence and Pedro Neto are doing pretty well in their own right. I don't think Wolves will be too displeased with how things are going on the pitch and we'll watch out for what happens in January. A question from Andrew. With Gedson Fernandez contract ending with Spurs, is there a way back for Deli Alley into the first team or will he be loaned out in January? The Gedson Fernandez loan from Benfica was 18 months, Andrew, and so it doesn't officially expire until the summer. But I think you're referring to some comments, including by Jose Mourinho, that they may bring this chapter to a premature end because it hasn't worked out nearly as well as hoped and Gedson may head back to Portugal in the winter. The Deli Ali predicament is completely separate. He also is not a key part of Jose Mourinho's plans. There was concrete interest in him from Paris Saint-Germain in the last transfer window. Also an element of interest from Inter Milan and Juventus that didn't come to fruition. PSG had a number of loan approaches knocked back by Spurs chairman Daniel Levy, who really likes Deli and wants him to stay. And I think they all agreed they would try and make this work out, but it hasn't and is not working out. There's been no bust up or fallout, but it doesn't feel like he suits Jose Mourinho's style, his um, structure, his approach, his personnel, his tactics, his system. And if you look at Tottenham's upcoming fixtures, you would see very few opportunities for Deli Alli to play consistently, especially in the Premier League. And at this stage of his career, his profile, his age... Uh, his background in the game and his ambitions. He wants to be playing regularly. He's probably not even thinking at this point about making it into Gareth Southgate's squad for Euro 2021, but many of us not so long ago would have expected him to be at that level. It leads me to feel that Deli Ali will want to move in January. It's just about whether it's on loan or permanent. If it's a club at Tottenham's level or lower, you'd probably think permanent because if you went there on loan and it didn't work out well, there's possibly no way back but if you go to a so-called bigger club like a PSG then a loan would be suitable because whatever happens you would like to think you can come back to Tottenham and make some kind of impact further down the line. The key to all of this of course is Daniel Levy. Whether it can happen or not is in his hands. He's got Deli Ali under contract until 2024 so another big decision for him to make there. I suspect that talks will really start to gather pace on this from around mid-December time as they try and find a suitable solution for all. Finally, we have Khalid. Are Man United looking to sign players in January and what key positions may they be looking to strengthen? I know Man United have recruitment plans for the summer of 2021. I just don't know what they are at this point in time. What we could see, similar to what I explained with Liverpool earlier, is United escalate and bring forward some of those plans to January if the need meets opportunity and availability. We saw United do it with Bruno Fernandes. Having spent the whole of last summer prioritising a senior right-sided attacker, Jadon Sancho the top target, and it didn't come to fruition, I wondered whether United might revisit that in the winter window, but you've got to remember that they've got Diallo coming in from Atalanta, subject to work permit, and Palestri is already on the ground here acclimatising, so it doesn't feel to me like the right-sided attacker is going to be addressed in the upcoming window. I stand to be corrected. Um, What we do know is that Odion Igalo is scheduled to leave, so that would give United a striker fewer but they did bring in Cavani uh, at the end of the last transfer window. Another question asked me about Jesse Lingard and Juan Mata, who are out of contract in the summer and United have options to extend their deals by a year, and Timothy Fosumenta, who is out of contract. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but history would suggest there's a very good chance 
that the two players with those options have them extended. Lingard younger, so United might want to protect the value. Mata older, but he has been playing some great football of late. Fosu Mensa, as far as I know, would really like to stay, but that's up to Manchester United. And I don't think decisions have been made on any of them just yet. Support for Ask Ornstein is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below the waist grooming. The world is about to get a lot less hairy because you can now buy Manscaped products and finally use the right tools for your family jewels, like the Lawnmower 3.0 electric trimmer with its cutting edge ceramic blade that reduces grooming accidents and keeps you feeling smooth. Its battery lasts up to 90 minutes, so you can even use it for the entire length of a football match. Then comes the Weed Whacker, your essential nose and ear hair trimmer. Both products are part of the Manscaped Performance Package that includes a t-shirt, athletic boxer briefs, deodorant, toner for, yes, down below, a wash bag to keep it all together, and a newspaper. Why? Well, why not? Happy shaving. <laughs>